And we are back with my co-host as always, Dean. That is me. And the almighty, awesome Andy Galpin. Welcome. Ah, pleasure to finally connect here. You guys got some internet, so that's a good start. <laughs> it does make us sound like the old, like, ah, Australia, we're a little bit caught away from the rest of the world. Our We've internet, just got the internet. Our internet generally sucks in Australia, nearly stuck in the Stone Age. Mm. Now, Andy, do you want to give uh, our listeners a quick intro as to who you are, what you do, and why you do it? Sure. I am a professor at Cal State Fullerton, and uh, I'm the director for the Center for Sport Performance. So within that, we have a whole host of research laboratories, and we study anything under the umbrella of human performance. So from the biomechanics angle, sports psychology, uh, motor control, exercise physiology, muscle physiology, strength and conditioning, etc. So a third of my life is, is to run studies uh, in these areas, and of course, muscle biology being my particular specialty. So we take muscle biopsies from folks and study them at the molecular and genetic and cellular level, all the way up to you know performance-based outcomes. So we don't study disease or obesity or things like that. It's always this end of the, the performance spectrum. Uh, I teach uh, at the graduate level and courses like strength and conditioning, program design, uh, nutrition for performance, etc. And then I also work with uh, professional athletes. So I work with a lot of combat sport athletes, so a lot of UFC fighters, um, major league baseball players, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit of science, a little bit of teaching, and then a little bit of uh, application as well. That's the general gist of what I do. And a lot of awesome. Because you have your head around so many things, it was kind of difficult for us to narrow down what we were gonna talk to you about, because I feel like we could talk to you for days. Mm. But um, yeah, so we wanted though, however, to land on weight cutting strategies for performance athletes. Yeah. And I thought that we would start by introducing um, your idea around the cook, the baker and the chef. And it might not be clear how those things relate yet, but go with me, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to um, kick us off with giving us a quick summary around the cook, the baker and the chef? Sure. The, I guess the gist of it setting up that setup, if you will, is, you know, I'm a scientist and uh, I don't necessarily identify as a scientist, though. It, it sort of sounds weird when I even say it out loud to myself, although people from the outside perceive me as that. Uh, that's not there. And I say that to help you understand I come from the practical side first. You know, I was a, a collegiate athlete and, and I always approach science from, from that side. So when I would see studies or see research or hear scientists talk, always in the, in the back and, and in fact, in the front of my head a lot of the times, so I would always think like, that's just never gonna work or sure, but that's really limited, et cetera, et cetera. And, and all the limitations of science. And so then when I became a scientist and started going in this world, I've always kept that in mind, especially because I actually do work with athletes. And so you don't see many scientists like me who actually then legitimately work very hands-on with elite level performers and so when I developed the cook baker chef thing it was because I, was, I would try to connect this bridge between science and application and I found okay great if I simply you know if we plant a flag at each end, each end of the spectrum and one end being you just simply preach whatever comes out in the latest meta-analysis and that's what you have all your athletes do and it doesn't take a lot of creativity to realize how short-sighted that's going to be or, or really any experience at all the other end of the spectrum is simply, I don't listen to science at all. I just do what I've been taught and what other people do on the internet, et cetera. And quite clearly, both of those are problematic. And so we want to land somewhere in between, but navigating and finding out where and how far we push on either end of the spectrum is, is quite difficult. So I would always try to figure out how do I put my athletes in a position uh, or the clients I'm working with to have the most success. So we're always going to use scientific principles. But we have to understand when to break those rules, when to go outside of them, and when to give up, say, scientific efficacy for uh, execution. What will the athlete do? Uh, does that make sense to them? Is that too complicated for them? And I can tell you as a great example, you know, when I work with a, a UFC fighter, and they have 12 to 15 training sessions a week, and they've got four to six sport coaches. They've got marketing they have to deal with. They've got social media. You, you can't put them on a carb cycling program. They have to probably eat the same thing every single day. It's just too complicated. They, they won't be able to pay, unless you literally are making all their meals for them yourself. It's just not going to work. And so you would say, okay, ideally we would do this on these days, and but these training days, are, okay, great. Good theory, 
very difficult to execute for some athletes. But then I was finding actually some that's easy to execute. And so I'm like, man, how the hell do I approach these different personality types? And, and are they a world champion level fighter? And they've got millions in the bank. Or are they maybe a top 10, but they are broke? Um, well, I have to approach and, and speak to them and coach them differently because one classic example of a bad way to coach is to coach your athletes how you like to be coached. Mm -hmm. um, that's clearly the, the wrong approach. You need to meet them on their level if you're the one that's trying to be effective. So now to answer your pre-question question. So what I developed is, is kind of a simple framework or model, and I have a similar one for actually identifying fighters if you want to get into that too. Um, but it's just what I call uh, baking, cooking, and, and being a chef. And the fundamental answer is, you know, what's the difference between baking and cooking? Well, baking is a specific science, right? So you can't bake a cake or a pie or anything that requires those things by just saying like, oh, well, was it a, was it a milliliter or was it an ounce? Ah, it's kind of close enough to throw it. Like, well, you can do that when you cook, right? It doesn't really matter. You know, cooking is just put the pan in the oven, put oil in it, whatever's in the refrigerator goes in that pan. Whenever that's kind of the temperature you want, add hot sauce, add cheese, maybe a little more sour cream, like fantastic. It's all edible there, right? Uh, clearly baking is the exact opposite. And so what I would find is if I had a discussion with, um, say, Jenna, and Jenna's a New Zealand girl, so she's kind of down to you guys. Um, fantastic Muay Thai fighter, multiple time world champion, um, just getting her into her MMA career. Um, if I said, hey, I want you to have like, you know, a little bit more fat with your breakfast, I, I would be able to see her heart rate elevate. Mm -hmm. I could see her like sweat. She'd be like, what do you, like, what do you mean? Like, and I can't do New Zealand accent. I would try, but. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. like, what do you, yeah, no. <laughs> Like, what do you mean a little more fat? Like, well, like, well, like, 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 half, like, and then so not having that level of precision actually gave her anxiety. Um, so I would eventually, in fact, I would send her on Sundays a specific shopping list that included the exact amount. So two and a half red bell peppers, like four bananas, exactly. And then that equated to the exact total amount of all food we needed the entire week. So that by the end of the week on Saturday night, she was literally out of food. Mm. And that she wanted that level of precision. Now, the sneaky trick is I had to guess on most of those numbers, right? Like, I don't know how accurate that, because you don't know that level of precision, right? But she didn't care. She wanted that level of detail, and that relieved anxiety for Jenna because she knew she had a specific plan, and there was no guesswork there. Other folks, if I tried to do that same thing with Tatiana Suarez, another female fighter, like she would be like, no, like too much to think about, bro. Like I got this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And so she would want concepts like, Okay, take a picture of your breakfast. Okay, great. You know what? Next time, have a little more fat. Uh, where should I get from? I don't know. Put a little more avocado on there. Cool. Roger, daughter, I'm off. Any more level of detail she would have problems with. And so I would call Jenna a baker where she wants chemistry. She wants very specific numbers, right? Uh, where Tatiana would be a cook. Just like, give me concepts. What are we trying to get to here? And then let me have my creation. So, and, and I've got a lot more detail and discussion on that in other places if you want. But that's the gist of what a cook is versus a baker. And it, again, it's just a system of how I can communicate with the athletes, even though I might be wanting them to do the exact same thing. Uh, I have to approach it perhaps differently if I want them to succeed as best as possible. And from what I understand, a chef is someone that understands both uh, and knows when to apply which one. Yeah. So the chef would be the more of like, um, probably you folks, right? Or the coach where, where you could say, okay, great. You spent years and years and years being a baker. You followed specific recipes. You did it exactly like you were taught to do. You didn't deviate from the plan. You did it and you did it. And so you understand not only the rules, but you understand in this example, the chemistry. So you understand how the polyunsaturated fats are working and you understand why when you cook them at this temperature, it has a different effect when you cook them at this temperature. And when you eat cold potatoes versus eating them hot, and you understand that to the level. Once you get to that space, now you can start breaking rules. You can start doing things. Oh, I thought you're never supposed to eat this. But, well, you can when you understand that level. The problem is most folks who are a line cook at McDonald's want to all of a sudden become a chef. Whoa. It's like, yo, you've done one meal. Like you've done one fitness competition. Now all of a sudden you want to start breaking and rewriting your rules. Like you're, you're a McDonald's chef trying to open up or McDonald's cook trying to open up your own restaurant. So, um, you know, getting to a chef, you can start breaking rules and can make exceptions, but you have to, again, like a, a, literally a chef would not open a restaurant after cooking for four weeks. 
Yeah. Right? You would probably spend years in culinary school and make thousands of failed meals before you ever called yourself a chef. I really love how simply the, the baker, the cook and the chef uh, kind of help people understand this concept because um, at Flex Success, we really see clients come to us that are just trying to lose five kilos. It's just like Karen who has a desk job and she thinks she needs to be a chef. <laughs> a chef. And oh, it's really right. challenging for us to kind of take a step back and be like, look, why don't we just focus on getting more vegetables in your diet? And she's like, but I thought I needed to because she's getting all of these confusing messages from Instagram and whatever. And so at Flex, we developed something called informed eating, and that's which is basically a cook, um, where we kind of meet people where they're at, figure out what their knowledge gaps are, how can we create some behavior change? And, you know, maybe some education around macronutrients because maybe they're choosing almonds as a protein source and they don't realize it has fats and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and then eventually, like, we're not going to count. We're not going to weigh food. We're just going to do something called informed eating. So based off the knowledge that you now have from some level of being a chef, but maybe less than what you want initially, um, you can just go away and make informed choices and just continue with these concepts. But yeah, if the, somebody... The... Mm -hmm, the general crossover here is I actually firmly believe everyone who's in this space coaching or personally, whether this is any information for you or people you work with, should spend three, four, five months of their life in baker mode where you weigh everything on a scale, you follow precise recipes, right? But what we, what you would clearly find is that is less, uh, I'm blanking on the word, but it, it you can't do it as long. Mm. It's not a right? crime. Right. So what you want ideally is to have the ability to go float back and forth between cooking and baking because it's not sustainable is the word, right? You just, most people can't live like that. And so your informed eating would be an example of saying, okay, let's move towards being a cook. But sometimes in order to do that, you need to spend, maybe it's 30 days, you know, charting everything on my fitness pal, figuring out and being aware of what you're actually doing so that you don't realize like, wow, I thought my almond milk had a ton of protein, but it turns out it has a gram. Cool. shit right or whatever else the things are i didn't realize a handful of almonds was like this not this and now that's 600 calories like ah Ooh, oh my god a table, tablespoon of peanut butter when hungry is much bigger than one <laughs> right so um i think it's important that we do both and so what I, my general recommendation is if you have a specific goal and a specific date in mind then it's probably pretty good to go to baking mode Lockdown, you got a wedding in four weeks. Okay, let's do this. Let's really start paying attention and we can get there. But then for general life practices, you want to go to in becoming a cook. And the beauty of this analogy is if you find a true chef, chefs don't fall, don't have a recipe book in front of them, right? They don't have that. So if you spend enough time baking and reading recipes and following plans and dipping back into this, you will eventually get to a place where you don't actually have to have those because you'll be able to look at a pile of celery and go, okay, I know that's probably about this much. And I can look at that plate of rice and go, okay, that's probably a hundred grams. Okay, fine. And you won't have to weigh and measure everything. So your ability to be more precise with less effort goes way, 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 way up. If you only stay in one of those two lanes, the baking lane only becomes less sustainable. The cook lane only is less specific. Mm. So you don't truly learn enough. And so that's my general recommendation is um, if they come to me and they, they want, you know, that precise thing, it's like, okay, well, are you ready to do this? Are you ready for this to be a super high priority in your life for the next 30 days? Ah, uh, shit. No, not really. Okay, great. Well then let's just float into cook mode. But eventually I think you all should, you know, spend some time there. Mm. You do that for enough months, all of a sudden those months add up into years and all of a sudden five years down the line, you don't have to weigh your chicken because you can go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's 40 grams. That's 200 grams. Yeah, yeah close enough. Right? Yeah. So th that's why I think we, we win um, in life with this thing is, is to be able to handle both. As somebody who was a chef, uh, sorry, a baker for far too long um, and got frustrated with it, I can tell you that it's really relieving to be on the other side um, where you can be a cook and, and still follow. So I recently did a, a mini cut and I did it without weighing a thing because I spent so long being a chef that... Totally. Yeah, cool. two kilos came off in, you know, three or four weeks and no issues. Yeah, Just... but I also think like the interesting thing is that people think that athletes often have to always be the chef as well, whereas there are times in which they can be the cook. And the majority of the time I find they actually are far better off in cook mode than they are in chef mode. Because Yeah, I would almost never put a, a, an athlete in chef mode. Yeah, because they've already they, got enough to worry about. 
they aren't going to have to worry about, and they probably only have partial information. Mm. Yeah. So at best, we'll go to baker mode, but I would never let them float into chef mode. Yeah. Uh, so this you just is don't know what you're doing enough. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to tie this into weight cutting strategies um, because obviously there's some precise ingredients that we need for weight cutting strategies, or there's, there's a tighter range that we need to work within. Um, but for off seasons, perhaps not so much. Mm. So this is, yeah, this is sort of how I wanted to tie it in. Yeah. So I guess uh, the interesting thing that you brought up before too, Andy, is that there's, when there's a time specificity component to the end goal, then then you can become a little bit more baker, a little bit more specific. So what are some of the variables are that you think that people need to first and foremost take into consideration the time specific goal, like a weigh in that you may be doing via weight cutting strategies as opposed to slowly dropping body fat or something like that. And we're talking, we're not talking about like Karen who wants to lose five no. kilos to feel better. We're talking about athletes trying to make weight for a competition. Performance athletes specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we have to clarify a couple of nomenclature pieces. Uh, if we're talking weight cut, we, we typically would break those up into two, almost three different areas. So area one is the six to 12 weeks out where you're trying to lose a little bit of body fat, right? You're trying to come down. Um, you're, you know, you, you started at your 90 kilos and you got to be at 77. Well, we can't do that in three days. We, we don't want to anyways. And so there's a portion of that weight cut, which is the slow, gradual re reduction of body fat, increase in hydration over time. Then we have what we call fight week, right? Competition week. So this is typically if you're weighing on a Friday morning, what do you look like Monday? So the phase one gets you to Monday of fight week. Phase two gets you from Monday to Thursday of fight week. And then phase three is the last day, the, the super water cut. And so there's three real pieces to that. And I'm happy to expound on any of those three phases, whichever one um, you want to go after because because they have the strategies and the techniques are all quite different for all three of those. Yeah. I think um the the biggest mistakes are made between phase two and phase three. So yeah okay so week of we'll jump we'll jump phase one mm. hopefully assume which we should oh, no, I'm, just... I'm, I'm, I'm joking nobody there's not a lot there's not a lot of people out there that do phase one exceptionally well either. Um, but I think um, if we could go lowest hanging fruit would be phase two and phase three. So maybe we could start at phase two and then work our way through. Yeah, so the, before we even say this, you do have to realize this is, I'll give you some numbers and, and specific things, but it, it really totally depends on the athlete. Um, you can't take numbers that you're reading or hearing from me and just then apply them. You really have to pay attention because it really does determine if you've lost seven kilos in the previous nine weeks mm -hmm. or if you've lost 17. Well, that is completely going to change phase two. It's a big, big, big deal. Uh, are you walking into phase two fully hydrated? You've been eating carbohydrates. You're fantastic. Or are you walking and starting phase two and you haven't had a carbohydrate in four days? <laughs> Jeez, this is, a, this is a very big difference. So let's assume you just did it properly. Uh, your Monday of fight week, uh, you are, let's see, let's see, you compete at uh, 75 kilos and you currently weigh 83 kilos. Um, so you're eight kilos up Monday of fight week. But you started camp at 90, so you're already down seven kilos and you did all that properly. You're fantastic. Monday, you're hydrated, you're well fed reasonably, and you want to go from there. So Monday through Thursday is a combination of a couple of things. Um, you want to utilize your gut. You want to manipulate the amount of food just sitting in your stomach. You want to manipulate the amount of water in your body, uh, the electrolyte in your body, as well as... Uh, I should say when I say your gut, I mean literally your stomach as well as your intestine. And those are two separate things as well. And then, of course, at the very end, you're just going to try to trick the scale as much as humanly possible by not getting it there. So phase one would be your phase two in this analogy, Monday through Thursday. It's a little bit of, well, it's a decent amount of being hypochloric. So you're probably going to train somewhat hard. Um, in different combinations, some folks that's every day, some folks that's maybe Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, save some energy for Thursday, it kind of depends. But you want to see if you can burn a kilo or two just by being under calorie. So you might eat a thousand calories that day, but you might burn two or three thousand. And so that's going to gain you a couple of pounds over the course of three or four days, depending. If you reduce your fiber intake, starting probably on Tuesday, something that ballpark, you can clear out, you know, maybe one to two kilos from just your intestines moving around. And so you're not going to eat a bunch of broccoli that week and you're going to uh, not eat things that take three or four days to get through your system. You're going to basically eat stuff that gets in and gets out 
and it doesn't just have weight in your stomach. So things that are very rapid in digestion uh, and you get you through. So that might buy you those two things in combination might buy you four kilos right there uh, or higher. You're eventually going to start tricking um, uh, water intake, and this is water intake comes from a combination of two things. So you're gonna you could increase potassium by taking something like a potassium supplement, or you know by by food ways, as well as decrease sodium intake. Same thing, you just eventually will stop taking in salt or get very very low in salt intake. You'll you'll have probably done some sort of water loading, um, or if not, it doesn't even really matter that much. But you do those things, and you're gonna start pouring out water pretty quickly. You also will. Uh, probably Thursday or, uh, you know, depending Wednesday, maybe you'll probably try to dump a bunch of muscle glycogen. So you do a pretty hard workout and get those things low. So that also has the advantage of helping you rid your muscle of water. So you do those, all of those things in combination. By the time you show up to Thursday, you're already down five, six kilos and, and you're not even really feeling that bad other than the fact that you've been like kind of hungry for three days, but kind of hungry for three days is not hard at all. When you consider fitness and figure folks are kind of hungry for like four months. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, it's not much to really um, complain about. Um, like you ask any random girl in LA and they haven't, you know, had a thousand cal over a thousand calories in six years. So uh, like, it's not that difficult. I don't have a lot of sympathy for them. And they're like, ah, oh, I'm hungry. So that's what you would typically do to lead it up. Um, you still want to have a decent amount of fat and decent amount of protein though. By the end of that, you don't want to have a ton of protein sitting in your stomach either. And then on the, the day before, you want to eat actually kind of high calorie, uh, just low weight foods because you can still get the calories in there. But at this point, you're just now, I mean, you can, what we basically do is you take the food, put it in your hand and step on the scale. Oh. And if you get things that have a lot of calories but don't weigh much, it's going to be sitting in your stomach by the time you step on the scale, but you actually won't feel terrible because the calories would be there. So you kind of do a bit that's, that's counterintuitive, but you're really just tricking the scale to that point. So the night before, of course, you would do some sort of pre- pretty gnarly dumping of just pure water, hopefully float half to one kilo, wake up the next morning, depending on the timing, and then do a more water cut or start your water cut uh, or not, and then you'll, you'll be there. So that, that's how you would kind of get that phase two to phase three, seven kilos off, and, and it won't really be that bad. I mean, it's not fun, especially Thursday night because you don't really sleep, but it just depends on when your weigh-ins are as well. Mm. So the, the three common strategies there from a, uh, just to sort of uh, rehash this again, would be uh, a low food residue diet that would be happening somewhere in the sort of between five and seven days out to drop a, one or two kilos. And for those that aren't aware of a, uh, a low food residue diet, it'd be one that's either like energy dense, calorically dense program of food or very low in fiber. Um, we've got carbohydrate depletion so that we can get a little bit of glycogen depletion. And then in the final phase, you've got hydration manipulation. Yeah, I mean, you're manipulating hydration all the way to like sometimes up to nine days out. Yeah. Um, but it just depends on, there's a lot of ways to go about it there. But the, the real dump in hydration would be at the least amount of time possible. Ooh. So ideally, you know, the evening, the night before, or it just depends on when your weigh-ins are. But, but that'd be great. You don't want to start dehydration three, four, or five days out. That's going to be a problem. Yeah. Same thing with carb depleting, in my opinion, too. But Yeah. Now, what would, would you, as, a, as an individual potentially prescribing, I understand there's some individual variability here also, is it always better, or do you think it potentially is better, I should say, to go for the synergistic approach that's less intense per strategy, or would you try and just evoke the best out of one strategy each time and then sort of go with it? It depends on the specific sport. Well, and here's why I say that. If you're talking an Olympic wrestler, well, this is very different considerations than somebody who's prepared to box 12 rounds in a world championship fight because you have things like hydration of the brain. So you can't afford to get your brain super dehydrated as a boxer, knowing you're going to take punches. You're going to take a bunch of punches and you got to do that for a long amount. Well, in wrestling, you've got, you know, a couple of three minute rounds and there's, there, there's some head collisions, but it's nothing the same thing. So you can afford to take some different strategies there. Um, do you have to be able to fight for 25 minutes, five, five minute rounds, or is it a three round fight? Th this is all very, very different. So in kickboxing, totally different things. So you have to pay attention to all of those. And it also depends on, uh, how big of a fight it is and the athlete's experience. So for example, if I have an athlete who's never done a water cut before, 
Well, I'd want to minimize that amount as much as possible so they don't have to cut seven pounds of water, you know, three kilos, four kilos, nine kilos. You don't want to do that when out there they're going to freak out. Where if someone who's been doing this their whole life and like, and you say, hey, yeah, we got to cut three kilos of water, they're like, sweet, easy. So I would really, at that point, invoke the art sort of a coaching and pay attention to, to what's going on. We've also had issues where logistically you show up and there's no sauna. Oh. Like this has happened to us in Mongolia. This happened to us in um, Venezuela and Argentina. And you're like, great, the hotel doesn't have a hot water, really. It's kind of like lukewarm bath water. Like, what do you do? Well, let's get the towel wraps out. Okay, hmm. Great, Olympic weightlifting, different sport. Like you can't, you can afford to be pretty dehydrated in Olympic weightlifting, but you can't, like you can't be low in muscle glycogen. That's not going to work. Um, you have heavy legs. So it really depends on the, the sport you're going after and the situation that you're in. You know, do you have access to food? Can you get off the site in China? Or do you have to stay in the hotel? Korea, like we've had all these problems everywhere. So you want all your tools to be able to solve problems. Could we unpick a couple of those problems a little bit more? So like, for example, like maybe it'd be easy if we gave some, some individuals. So we, you're primarily in fighting and potentially also in other Olympic weightlifting and stuff like that. For a powerlifter uh, or a performance athlete in powerlifting, which one of those variables do you think would have the largest impact on them for the negative? Like, is it the glycogen depletion? And then if so, why? Or is it more the hydration? And if so, why? And so on. Well, I'll put it this way. I, I recently had an athlete um, who was all worried about the sleep the night before. So if you, for example, if you cut a lot of weight the night before, okay, then that means you don't have to get up super early. The weight's already off. You can kind of go to bed knowing you're on or you're really close or there's minimal work left to do, right? Uh, and so some athletes sleep a lot easier. They're like, okay, we made it. I'm on. And I know that I'm, I'm on weight 12 hours before I needed to be, but at least I'm on weight. Uh, other folks are like, why the hell would I be dehydrated and gassed 12 hours early when I could just get up and do it, you know, basically get a good workout in, then weigh in and then rehydrate. I'm totally fine. Um, but some folks won't sleep like that. They'll just be like, no, they'll, they'll literally just sit there the whole time. And I've had one girl, she was like three o'clock in the morning. She's like, let's just go. I want to just start cutting out. Like I just, I'm, not, I'm laying here. Like, let's just fucking go. She's like, all right, <laughs> let's just go. Uh, we could do it. So it depends. Are you, are you weighing in even for powerlifting at nine in the morning? Probably fairly early because your meat's going to start early because you're going to start deadlifting soon. Or is it a three o'clock start? Uh, I've had all those scenarios, right? Where evening starts and the morning starts. Totally different situation. Um, if you have two hours to weigh in, do you have 24? Do you have 30 hours? In powerlifting, you probably got two hours in some federations and others you got 24. So for powerlifting, if you got 24 hours, man, I would dehydrate the shit out of yourself. Who cares? You're gonna get, you're gonna be totally fine. But um, you know, and same thing with fiber. Who cares? Get that stuff out of your stomach. You don't need any of that. Um, you're gonna go without a few hours of sleep the night before a powerlifting competition. You're gonna be just fine. You're gonna be jacked full of so much ammonia and caffeine, anyways. One bad night of sleep ain't gonna suck. But you know what would suck? Five straight nights of bad sleep. Mm -hmm. So if you're dehydrating, or if you're cutting carbs out way too early, and you're cutting calories too early and you're hungry and you can't sleep for five straight days, that might start to influence your performance that day out. So um, again, like I, I know that it's, you listen home, you're like, well, just give me like a, it's just, it's, it's just matters too much. Like the details are really precise here. Yeah. So I can't even within a single sport say, hey, this is the way to go because this, the rules and the federations are so different. The time you allotted, um, and are you traveling? Are you, are you at home? Are you waking up? driving to the venue. Um, I mean, what we certainly can say is things like, if you look at basic physiology, you know, you know someone who's going to wrestle six matches in one day, they're going to have different demands and different problems and limitations to someone who's got to do three reps in one day and then, you know, go home. Cool. So uh, hydration, probably a lot less important. Things that have a higher cardiovascular component, hydration is going to play a bigger issue. Things that are all phosphogen and ATP PCR driven, they're going to be just fine if you're a little dehydrated. You're gonna be just fine if you're a little bit sleepy. Um, th those things won't play as big a deal, but you run out of muscle glycogen and you've got to do, you know, uh, 12 rounds, three minute rounds, you're not gonna have the legs by the end of those, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12, 11th rounds. So you wouldn't wanna have so much of a glycogen depletion, especially if you don't have 24 hours or more to replenish muscle glycogen. Are you getting kicked in the head or beaten the head at all, or are you just lifting a weight? Um, well, then you can have different strategies there as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
these are all really good examples of why we can't just buy some copy and paste weight cutting template off the internet because there are so many, like the devil's in the detail for mm. sure. Um, and just to add another level of nuance, I know that you've gone through Brett Bartholomew's Conscious Coaching. Yeah, I, I did the audio book of that and I, I really liked it uh, because it showed that we're not just coaching the athlete, we're coaching the whole person, their fears, uh, their dreams, their everything. Um, so I'm wondering if you would consider any of the personality archetypes from the conscious coaching book. No. Yeah, I, actually, I don't love that stuff personally. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I know, I know Brett very well. Um, you know, and I, I was on that thing before that book even came out. So, um, I mean, I'm, obviously, a lot of the things I talked about are similar concepts. I don't like those personality types personally. Um, it's too much. It's like 12 of them or something, right? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a I'm lot. like, at what point is it just like, we're just a bunch of different people? <laughs> I'm like, God, how many personality types could we possibly come up with? I mean, I know I said that having just spent like 20 minutes talking to you about the three different ones that I created, right? So I'm like, my system's great. His sucks. No. Like, so for me, it's just, it's like, it's too much. Um, it's, it's too much to do. Uh, and, and I don't work with athletes that level. So what, what I do and what you mentioned earlier is about like, we can't buy copy and paste sort of strategy for folks. And I don't know what you guys do as a company, but um, I don't have a company with this. I am intentionally non-scalable. So the way that I do this is not meant to be able to be worked out over people, over a bunch of, over a bunch of people. I promote and strongly encourage individuals to have a one-on-one -on -one coach as closely as, as possible, you know, as you can. And so that's the way I coach because I enjoy that a lot more. So I don't care about the personality types as much because I'm going to spend so much time working with that person one-on-one. -on -one. I intentionally take very, very few, very low amounts of individuals. And this is the worst way ever to run a business. <laughs> so I don't know anything about that. Um, so when you're like having to live on this, like I get it. Uh, but no, I, yeah. Like, so that's kind of my reaction to those things is, Okay. Is I guess I create individual avatars based on the people because I spend so much time with them um, that, that I can, I can use some scaffoldings like that, but the rest, you know, I, tr I try to go through and I'm like, all right, Brett, like I'm out. I can't do this stuff, man. <laughs> Too many. We have that in common as well at flex. We have no templates. Um, yeah. We also cap ourselves in how many clients we take on because we know that if we go above that cap, then our level of service suffers and, and we don't want that. So um, agreed, probably not the best scalable business model, but yeah. it's the best one for the client and we have a client centric focus. So, but even like, like selfishly, I don't enjoy it as much if I have too many people because I can't actually pour myself into the individual, which is the whole point of being a coach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, there's, there's different ways to approach it, but that's certainly the, the thing I like for yeah. sure. So, so we no, got no, no, no shots, anybody that does it differently. Um, I mean, I, I work with a lot of folks and friends that, do the exact opposite and they actually like other aspects and there are certain aspects about how we do it that they don't like, which is fine enough. And so there, there's beauty in both approaches. No question. If we could um, maybe pull, like obviously uh, pulling back into the specifics of the weight cut again, for those that are listening, I'm not looking for numbers specifically, but maybe rather uh, the considerations that an athlete or a coach trying to help an athlete should take into consideration for like at what level of dehydration would we typically see certain performance impacts? And then even similarly, like how fast can we get back hydration and even uh, like glycogen repletion if we're on a time scale? Yeah. So the typical numbers you'll see with uh, any cardiovascular related performance act outcome is going to see reductions with as little as two to 3% uh, of your body weight. So if you weigh hundred kilos, and you have lost two kilos of water, that's 2% body weight reduction, right? Um, you would anticipate to see five to 10% reduction in peak performance. But again, this would be like a, of a cardiovascular, type, not, not maximum vertical jump or you know, peak bench press or anything like that. We don't know necessarily the numbers on a lot of that other stuff. So you start scaling now down to the four or five, 6% uh, of, of body mass reduction and, and you see massive drops in physical performance, right? In your ability. So what you have to ask yourself is, what sport are you dealing with? Uh, an example, you're working with a rower, okay? And we've had this before. And the entire point of rowing is to row as fast as possible. There's a set distance and there's a set thing, right? And the entire thing is based on maximal time, right? Or minimal time, however you want to think about it. You can't afford to have a 4%. You can't even probably afford to have a 3% drop in performance there. 
because you are off, you are losing, you, you cannot win. When you think about MMA, we don't, we have to be cardiovascularly fit, but that's a secondary outcome. The outcome is I could have better technique, I could uh, stop the person, I, I, could, I could win differently. So endurance is a part of that, but it is not the direct outcome. So a rower could not afford to be a little bit dehydrated and lose percentage where an MMA fighter could certainly fight at 90% and win a whole lot of world titles because there are other ways to win the fight. Weightlifting is, is, is uh, more akin to rowing. Powerlifting is more akin to rowing where it is a 100% max effort. If you're 97%, you went from breaking the world record to not even placing in that meet. So you can't, can't afford to have small reductions because of things like a little bit of dehydration. Um, so how fastly can you replenish them? It depends on how much has been depleted. So if you just kind of took a hot bath the night before and maybe did a towel wrap or something, you're, to you're going to replenish every ounce of water uh, if you have 24-hour rehydration. That's not going to be an issue whatsoever. You lost 2 or 3% of body mass in water and you had 24 hours replenish and you're not in a head contact sport, you're going to be just fine. You did a, you know, a couple of days of a little bit low carb and you dropped muscle glycogen by 15%, you can recover that in 24 hours or probably pretty close, right? Close enough. Um, did you have to not eat a carbohydrate for seven days? You had to train your ass off? Well, you cannot exp you're not going to get a full recovery in 24 hours. You might need 48 hours, maybe 72 hours to really come back for it. So uh, hydration of the brain is a big component of it. Amount of muscle glycogen, um, total hydration is, uh, those are the three areas. Uh, the other thing that we have to combat to is once we start our reload protocol, uh, do you get gastrointestinal distress from the amount of carbohydrate you put back in? Do you get, get back in, you know, diarrhea? Um, this happened to Brian Ortega in his, his last world title fight. Uh, you know, he, he weighed 146 pounds and, and started a rehydration process, was basically up sick with diarrhea the entire night before, did not sleep and fought in the cage at like 153, which is, you know, these are pounds, of course. Cool. Um, but this is you know, five kilos or so less than his opponent weighed, probably or more, right? Less than he normally weighs. So that was like, well, not a time issue. That was because he didn't know, and his coaches didn't know what the hell that they're doing at that time or even, even close. So uh, those would be several other considerations. And again, how much you can go up and down, what areas depends on the sport. So you just have to think back to your physiology. Uh, if you're a physique competitor, well, then pff, none of that matters because you're not competing uh, physically, right? You're just looking dehydrated and, and you don't, in fact, the reload doesn't even happen until you're done competing in that sport, right? So you compete in your lowest physical state relative to these other sports where you have to be the opposite. Ooh. Yeah. Sport. Yeah. We... <laughs> do we, do we call physique competitions a sport? We call it a beauty pageant where um, <laughs> the, the rules are kind of different. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to bite your lip. I, 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 <laughs> we, I both teams... competed in it and coach in it and I still take the piss out of it. It's, it's a competition. It's not a sport though. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, we're with you there. We totally agree. Yeah. Um, from a, a literature point of view, is there any indication as to the effectiveness of a, say, a oral rehydration versus IV and whether or not someone would go for one or the other? I mean, gastric, well, gastric issues could be an issue and obviously sport's going to be dependent on whether or not you're allowed to. But um, Yeah. Honestly, I don't spend any more time on the IVs because it's not legal in any of my sports. Yeah we can't do it. So, I mean, I know, well, <laughs> sorry. I mean, I got to be careful here. Um, in powerlifting, um, you know, this is, this is an option for Steffi Cohen. So that's one thing we can go to, um, and weightlifting we can't though. And all any of this stuff under USADA or WADA, I will see like we're, we're out on those things, but it was definitely, it's still an option for her. So it depends on when she's going into her competitions, like what, how much is she going down to, um, which weight class she's going to do it at. Uh, how much had to go down there before, but there's also personal preference. Um, I generally prefer to just do it with oral, uh, but some folks just dislike it uh, for a whole barrage of reasons. So um, that's about the only one I can think of where like we still have that as a viable option. Yeah. I found it super weird. I had a client that um, actually competed against Steffi two years ago in America and they promoted IV hydration on their form. Whereas in Australia, yeah. it's sort of unspoken, even though people do it, it's unspoken. Under the but, um, is there, would there, I know you said you haven't looked into it. Is there a preference though? If well, you have a preference of oral, is there any reason for that? Like, is it the synergy of you can also do carbohydrates at the same time as hydration or? Well, you can do that too with IVs. It's well, D5, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, you, you can go there too. Um, 
I can just, we can control pace a little bit better there, right? So you have to, to go through it. The, the folks or the individuals want to drink something. Um, to the level of dehydration we typically get is pretty severe. And so if we're just like, no, no, you don't need that water, like we're gonna get in the bag, they tend to not like it. But we've used it before. I've used it actually fairly recently um, for a, one particular situation where the, the athlete wasn't gonna be able to compete anymore. This is like, all right, let, let's just take you in there. And that was easier because it was uh, probably a, f hmm, let me do some math here, like a, almost a 15 or 16 straight hour water cut. Oof, yeah. And it was just like, okay, um, you're barely even unconscious right now. Like you're not, you're not around here. The IV, you need to just kind of sleep and lay here. Oh. We'll go to the IV bag uh, and sip a little bit of water, but mostly she's in and out of awake and stuff like that. So that was preferred there. Uh, but outside of that, um, we can control concentrations of things. Um, you really only have a couple of options with the IV bags, right? Whatever's in the D5 or the saline. And those are certainly not ideal. Um, we can control sodium. We can control potassium. Uh, we can control the carbohydrate type as well. Um, we can control and change things with, with food and calorie intake. I actually like getting in protein probably a lot sooner than other folks do. So I like to be able to do that as well. Um, so those are just kind of a bunch of different reasons. Any particular reason for the protein preference early? Yeah, I think it settles the stomach, man. Uh -huh. I, I feel like when you haven't you've had fairly restricted carbohydrate intake for quite a while, and then all of a sudden you dump in 200 grams carbohydrate, it's not great sometimes. <laughs> so now we obviously, well, I'm not literally meaning at once, but um, I like that we have an insulin effect there as well. Uh, but it also, I also feel like it, it helps them settle just a little bit. Um, for a broad reason. So we don't do it immediately and it depends on how much they've dehydrated. Uh, but it also depends on how quickly we're going to compete. So are we a two hour weigh in like weightlifting or like wrestling us back to now? Um, then I definitely want some protein in there. Uh, not a ton because it, it can take you in the wrong direction, but I like to settle the stomach a little bit. It just, I feel like they feel a lot better when they have something in there as opposed to just being like, Ooh, I feel like I just ate all you can eat pancakes. It's like, well, you did basically. Ooh. Right. So like, let's put a little bit of egg with that or whatever. Egg white. What do you see people typically, I suppose, doing wrong in the repletion of both hydration and carbohydrates and what could they do better? Yeah, too fast usually, uh -huh. right? So they go too quickly is a problem. Um, they typically use pre-made things like Gatorade and um, stuff like that. So the wrong form of carbohydrate are there. Uh, they don't pay attention to sodium quantities at all so either they're just they dump in way too much sodium and give give the athlete diarrhea um, or they just you know drink the gatorade or the powerade or whatever which is pretty pretty inefficient um, it's not the worst thing ever but it's not optimal either so those are two of the more common ones um, the other ones are that they don't they don't actually it's kind of like climbing the mountain right so you climb the mountain and you get to the top and then you're like great and then the sherpa leaves you like, well, you need to also walk them back down that mountain. So your job is not done until they, you know, really ideally 24 hours later. What I mean to say is people don't track things after that. So you're not tracking how much fluid have you ingested in total? How many grams of carbohydrate have you hit total? Let's count the food. Let's count all these things. What do, you, what do, you, what do we estimate our sodium intake to be if it's not measured? And then how are we hitting these numbers over time? When did you start peeing? How much did you roughly pee? Um, when, when was your first... Uh, poop after that like all those numbers are really really important and i don't see people paying attention to that they sort of like give them the protocol which is like here's what to drink off the scale and here's what to drink after that but then it's just like all right peace out Ooh. like well you didn't tell them what to eat when was their when was their first meal be when their second one meal? what should they eat for dinner what should they have the next morning did you track them what do they weigh the next morning what do they weigh at night so people just sort of let them walk off the scale and they they think okay once i made weight now i just got to eat and drink a bunch of I'm fine. You can, but you run the risk of bubble guts and, yeah. and then also feeling super lethargic the next day. And climb to the deep end without any floaties. <laughs> yeah. It's no fun at all. No. Oh. I, um, I'm really glad that we got to um, get into some of the different considerations so that people understand if, if you don't really have your head around all of this, the importance of getting a coach to look at all of your variables, what matters for your sports, what matters for you individually, um, and go from there instead of guessing your way through it. Cool. So, um, so thank you for all of those considerations. I hope that it was helpful for the listeners. Can I steal one more question? All right, go on. <laughs> Is there a limitation to the speed of 
uh, carbohydrate repletion or glycogen repletion? Is it like body weight dependent or is it time dependent? Well, it's going to be both, right? Yeah. So certainly if somebody who weighs 30 kilos versus somebody who weighs 300 kilos is going to be different, right? Because the absolute amount is quite a bit higher. Mm. Uh, it also depends on things like how many GLUT4 transporters you have. Mm. Um, so someone who's trained differently that doesn't have a lot of those things because they don't so utilize carbohydrate a lot in their performance or they haven't say altered their carbohydrate in their training at different times so that they have maximized that. Um, they've how much and how sensitized your cell is um, to glycogen storage was going to be altered by that as well. Insulin, the gut, how many gut, uh, transporters you have in the gut of glucose or fructose or whatever they happen to be. So all those things are going to play a factor and certainly size will change that because absolute amount um, will, will be altered as well. So both of those are going to play part of your equation. Is there a ballpark uh, like rate of which you could get carbohydrates back in? For example, like you could get through 10 grams per hour or 10 grams per kilogram per hour or anything like that? Yeah, well, what you, I think the better way to think about it, honestly, is to think about how many, how, uh, well, put it this way. I have seen a lot of people say those numbers, right? And they say, okay, well, uh, per gram of glycogen, you hold this much water. And so if you calculate the water, then you can get estimate glycogen amount, sorry, from there. Um, the problem is those numbers are so, the range of those numbers are so large, it's no longer usable. It's like, okay, the, there's something like three to five grams of water per gram of glycogen. Like, well, great. So multiply that and we have almost double the number. Mm. That, like, how are you going to think you're accurate there? So I don't think it's, it's particularly great. I would prefer to say something like, we know, um, we know how much body weight you lost in water for the most part, and you can calculate that. Let's make sure we're doing that at an appropriate number. And then let's make sure that we're hitting the numbers that we understand to be how much one can absorb in, in carbohydrate per hour and how much we need to ingest to maximize. And as long as we're in those ranges, uh, then we're fine. And you got to calculate total amount of calories, then, then you're all good there. But from there, it's really individual. I mean, I can tell you right now, like the amount of carbohydrate I give some folks, uh, even that are in the same weight category or close, is double Ooh. from others. Because, you know, like I give somebody 100 grams in an hour or something, and they're just like, oh, and stomachs is a wreck. And other folks, I'm like 200, and they're just like, let's go. So, I mean, you can memorize those numbers if you want, but I, I think it's, again, the range is so large, I don't see any futility in doing it. I'd rather just pay attention to the athlete track and know what works for them specifically. Mm. You yeah. mentioned their stomachs are uh, wreck, but I thought you said erect. And I was like, how do you erect a stomach? <laughs> and I'm also not mature enough to listen to the word erect and not laugh. <laughs> so it, it, <laughs> it took me a sec there. A wreck. Got it. <laughs> mm, that is true. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So uh, I don't know if you've uh, note, made note of the name or the motto or what do we even call it? A tagline of a the tag podcast. A tagline of the podcast is how to be less shit. Because we're, we're classy. We're classy. And, uh, Very mature. What is your how to be less shit tip for people doing weight cuts? Um, One almighty tip. <laughs> <laughs> Don't follow a template, maybe. Well, I guess the, the one marker I would, the one thing I would say is just track things. Just, just track things, you know, starting on Monday, what did you weigh? What did you do? What did you eat? Well, how did you feel? Just track these things. And if you do that over the course of five days or whatever your, your final cut is, you will learn a, a pretty good amount about um, how you feel and how you operate. And then when you do it again, when you change things, you'll start to realize like, oh, wow, this was awful. Or this was great. Or last time I was here when I did this and now it's there. So the, the being less shitty really comes out of just tracking first and foremost. Being aware. Collect some data and assess. Yeah. How unaware so many people are of what they even do on a day to day basis. Oh, oh I, fuck, bro. Yeah. I have so many professional fighters, and I'm like, you know, the first time they bring me in, they're, they're five to 20 fights into their UFC career. And I'm like, what do you normally do? They're like, I don't know. Like, what? You have 35 professional fights. You don't know how you do this? Wow. I'm kind of real. Yes, All right. You know what's frustrating about that is it just shows that the majority of the elite are elite because they're elite, not because they've necessarily trained themselves into the elite status. Because there's so many people out there that are just 
on a whole new level above other individuals and they don't even look like they try or anything. And you're just like, fuck. There's a constant reminder to me that, you know, there's definitely some fighters, quote unquote, there that fight them well, fight themselves up to the top, but goddamn genetic gifts. Um, an example of people tracking absolutely nothing. One of my girlfriends found out she was pregnant four and a half months into her pregnancy. And I was like, did you not get your period for the last four months? She was like, oh, I didn't even notice. <laughs> what do you mean? How did you not notice that situation? Anyways, I just woo, pay attention, people. <laughs> uh, I have two children, including a newborn. So I'm, I'm keenly aware of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh god we plan on never having children so i am keenly aware of that and he's tracking it <laughs> hey we were like that too for a long time and then she started to get old and she was like oh, and we talked about it for years and then after a couple of years of discussion we changed how would she feel about you saying that she started to get old well she's still getting older <laughs> bingo it's science bitch <laughs> <laughs> it happens it's true that's she, she is older than i am and so i have made it no no secret of our entire relationship, how old she is. It doesn't matter how old she is. She's always older than me. <laughs> so uh, there's two things, and you can ask her about this, that I have continually reminded her of since the dad met her, and that she's, one, is she's fat, and two, is she's old. Well, that's a way to make sure a lady's never uh, secure enough in herself to leave you. <laughs> uh, she, like, of course I can get away with that because it's the opposite, right? Like, she, <laughs> she is, she's super alpha. So if I ever be like, God damn it, you're fat. It's, it has less than zero effect on her self-esteem or self-worth and it has the opposite, right? It generally comes back with like, look at yourself fatty or like, don't walk by me in the kitchen because there are knives in there. Just things like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like the perfect playful relationship. Uh, she I, takes no shit at all. So I, I always love these moments where you have conversation with people and like, maybe we might use that as your 60 second snippet to promote this podcast. I'm thinking. Oh, I also but, want to cut out the part where you say you prefer oral. Um, oh, yeah. And erect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We might just mash them. <laughs> um, imagine writing that in into an email or someone. Can you please just com combine all of the following? Oh, yeah. yeah. We have a lady that cuts up our podcast, so we might do that. Uh, but my mm. point was going to be is that people will get a snapshot and they'll be like, man, Andy's a real asshole. Of course he's that. And they'll have no and idea of the, of the concept. <laughs> but I'm not sure if you're familiar with Broderick Chavez in America there, but he's this guy over there. The evil I, genius. I uh, do some cons uh, consulting with and stuff. And one of the first times I ever met him, he's a really crass dude. He was just like, oh, yeah, my wife, she's a big, fat, beautiful bitch. And I was like, what? Oh. And then he just started laughing. And he's like, no, no, she's just here. Look at her. She's the fucking size of an Amazon woman. And I'm just like, holy hell. She's very tall. And she's, she's a built lady. We love her. Yeah, she's a tank. Yeah. But that's just what he's like. And I just thought, man, if anybody had heard this snippet, they would have laughed at <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, no, it's all good. She doesn't care. <laughs> Now, we like wrapping up podcasts with just some quick, funny questions. The first one, not so funny. Ooh. Do you have something you feel is worth sharing with the audience? It could be a podcast, a book, I don't know, whatever, a quote, whatever you think, something worth sharing. Uh, well, I guess what I would say are two things. Number one, I will argue... Um, pretty heavily that we are in need of more than ever to people to take more ownership in such that you can assume when you hear or see something from someone else, multiple things, and you can choose to which way you position that assumption. Um, we don't always have to choose the same route. Is, is the subtle way to say it, right? So if you take more ownership and saying, wow, maybe that guy was an asshole, or maybe I didn't understand something, you know which one people always pick and you know which one I think you should probably try more often. Mm -hmm. So if you assume when you get criticism that it's because you didn't explain something clearly or because of it's the audience you've cultivated, that's your own fault, or it's the thing that you've allowed, um, your clients to do whatever it happens to be. It's your fault is what I'm saying. And I mean that as an empowerment strategy, not uh, wow, I suck. No, it's like, wow, fantastic. I, there's something I'm not doing the best here. This is a chance. This is a place for me to improve, but that requires ownership. And that requires you to actually funny enough, but actually be sympathetic and try to understand the position of others because we can disagree on things and not disagree on the outcome. 
Mm. For example, if you and I both say, hey, we, uh, we both think it's important for the human race in general to start getting a little bit leaner. The obesity problem, now we would clearly all agree on this, right? But then if you say, I think we should do that by making it illegal to buy sugar. I can say, you're a fucking idiot. And we're still actually in agreement with what we're trying to get to. We just disagree how we're trying to get there. And that's the part of, uh, that we deal with right now that is a struggle. So I can't go on there and criticize you for your idea because you then think that I'm anti-obesity. Mm. No, I'm just anti that method. Mm -hmm. or whatever. So that all of though comes back to me and you assuming the responsibility of you going, ah, mm, I see where the breakdown here. That was my fault. And the message wasn't appropriate and crafted. And my, and I can say, yeah, it was my fault. If I made an assumption here, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. that's the message I think I would send out to most folks is, um, you know, before you criticize, realize that, that we, we can disagree on things and that doesn't mean we disagree as people okay. or even where we're trying to go. We just think we need to get there a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say, and I told you to give you two here, maybe I said one, I lied, but I'm going to give you two, is I think more people need to listen to hip hop from the area of like 1982 to 1996, just because that's the greatest era of music ever. So that's it. Because of the political messages in hip hop? No, not at all. Just because it's the dopest shit ever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, Do you think Tupac's really dead? Yeah, and I tried like hell to get my dog named Tupac, and it didn't pass, and so actually I landed on Ghostface Killer instead. <laughs> That's the best. And then I tried like hell to get my daughter named Tupaca or Tupacina, and <laughs> I failed there, and then I tried like hell to get my son to be able to name my son Tupac, and that also failed, so. I did my um, high school English speech on Tupac. Did you? I did. I did indeed. <laughs> He's the tail end of the golden era. Past him, we start to slide, but really, um, I am a Tupac aficionado, so I could tell you all kinds of fun information about that man. Yeah, he, um, man, I just, I found him so interesting in his music to be um, so far beyond bitches and hoes. <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, mm -hmm. because hip hop can really slide sometimes. It can, it can go south yeah. into a lot of nothingness. But I, I so you want, me to you want me to explain the Dunning-Kruger effect with Tupac? And this is the unique thing. I don't, I don't okay. think people understand this. So when you first get into to hip hop, you may be like, wow, Tupac is awesome. He's great. He has all these hits and he's famous and blah, 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 blah. And then as your knowledge of Tupac starts to increase, you start to realize you're like, wow, lyrically, he's not incredible. And he kind of has very simple rhyme schemes. And he just kind of relies on charisma and energy, which is you know, so beyond palpable in his music and he, and he dominated everyone else in that culture or ever probably in there just with charisma. And so then people start to be like, actually, he's not that great of a rapper. And then once you actually study him more, you come back to the other side of the curve and you start to realize that he had an understanding of music. I mean, technically uh, far beyond what most people maybe only rivaled by like Rakim and a few others who really understand music theory, how those things work. And you start to realize where he puts specific words on specific beats and things like that. And you're like, wow, this dude is a savant, a, a, a lyrical savant. And you also realize that, keep in mind, imagine if, if you, you know, all the things you wrote up and the programs you developed and all the, the you know, like sample emails you tried to write. Well, you know, 90% of those get thrown in the trash because then you're like, okay, here's the final version. But then after you died, someone went back and released all your trash. Well, yeah. then you get to leave like, well, this guy kind of is good, but then he's just left a lot of suck. Well, that's what happened to him too, right? Like 80% <laughs> of the music was released after he died because it was shit he was throwing away. It was real throwaway rhymes. Mm -hmm. So you can't really count that against him. The stuff he put out was whew, pristine. So. Yeah. 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 That is true. Got to agree. Cool. Two pack fun. Um, we have three final questions. Yep. I want to save the second question for the second question. That sounds stupid. But the first one is, um, you've just been arrested. Nobody knows what you were arrested for in your family or friends. What would they assume you actually were arrested for? Standing up for Tupac. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, what would they assume I was arrested for? Mm. Let's see here. Probably. Well, I'll put this from my wife's perspective. I would, she would probably assume it would be for some sort of uh, inappropriate language. Because she is just like terrified to this day, as am I, that a student's going to complain because I said, hey, Liz, you look fantastic today. And then I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> like, 
Like it's because a culture like you, you, I'm terrified to say anything in class to anybody. And so like, and I'm pretty off color a lot of the time. So it, she would probably assume like, what the hell did you say in class? Like, what did you say to somebody? And now you got arrested, dummy. That's probably what it's going to be. That's you, funny. You don't I, want to become a Brett Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> I um, like most people and I start conversations with everyone and I'm thick skinned and I uh, feel like I can say really in, like the more inappropriate a joke is, the funnier it is. So I tend to put my foot in my mouth a lot. Mm. Um, and if someone does it to me, I like hilarious, we'll make best friends. But I, I feel the same. I'm kind of worried about like overstepping the mark on someone who's real sensitive mm. and being like, I didn't mean that I'm married. And like, <laughs> Liz, Liz once had an email conversation with a client we had just onboarded about how she, I'll say she for now, uh, needed to consider her menstrual health if she wanted to get to really, really low body fat uh, percentages on the assumption that it was a she because the name was Paris. That's a girl's name. But it was, Sorry. A, it was a dude. And yeah. he was just like, oh, I've been there before. I'm not sure why you're talking about menstrual cycles. I haven't got my period in my whole life. She's like, so I... it's nice to meet you. Let's start again. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we now yeah, do... you're going to eat that one. Let's just uh, chalk that up to a client you didn't retain. I, <laughs> I, I think that's like one of a hundred examples of me putting my yeah. foot in my mouth. <laughs> um, it's going to happen. Second well, question well, is oh. ethics aside, if you could. I like where this is going already because my ethics are minimal. <laughs> <laughs> what research would you run if they were aside now? This could be good for you. Any you, study. Any study, any research, any lab. What would you do if ethics weren't a consideration? Well, I don't actually feel like that's a great question for me because I think the question, the things I would say are not unethical anyways. Okay. So the things that I find like super interesting and that we really dope to do this are usually limited by money and time and resources rather than ethics so mm -hmm. now, what's the ultimate study then for you right now well I, th I think what would be interesting if we could really get to it would be to we need to use supercomputers or artificial intelligence and we need to study people in the areas of course of human performance uh, in large large sample sizes and we need to collect a a large array of different type of metrics. So we need to collect their stool samples. We need to collect their saliva. We need to ask them questionnaires every day. We need to collect their sleep data, et cetera, et cetera. Like we need to go in all those things that a practitioner would ask about as you're troubleshooting, right? But we need to collect those all together. And then the AI, why we need that is it needs to be able to seamlessly integrate how one of the systems is influencing the other one. And we can't do that with our current brains because you'd end up getting just spider plots and sheets and going all over and you're like, I don't understand. And you can't, the analysis, the statistical analysis that we have now just, just won't compute these things. And so we need to be able to track these things and start noticing, hey, uh, this is what actually mattered. We saw this in the salivary markers of, of cortisol and that actually synced up with um, the type of water they were drinking. Like, what the hell? or whatever else, it, it predicted the amount of growth in the, in the vastus lateralis, but it didn't predict you know, strength gains in the shoulder, whatever, whatever. Uh, and we, start, we can actually start to see answers. The problem is we approach research and teaching and coaching uh, in a silo. So yeah, yeah, there's endocrine system, and then there's the bone system, and then there's this, this but like, we, we tend to be like, wow, too much noise, like let's focus in on, did the body weight go down? Well, okay, fine, but that's probably a very short-sighted and simplistic and, and reductionist approach to going into it and then we just like give them a different calorie intake okay it may work for 70 percent, but what about the other 30 percent? oh they're non-responders no they're not non-responders they're, they're total responders we're just we don't know what lever to move on them uh, because we don't approach the whole system as a system we approach it as a system that's a bunch of individual things mm -hmm. together which is not how physiology works so mm -hmm. but that takes us time and money and things not necessarily ethics yeah that's cool yeah that is cool um now, to ask the next question, I think I need to know a bit of background on what your absolute favorite drink in the world is or food. Like alcoholic drink or any like beverage of any kind? Um, favorite drink, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, I'm a pretty big fan of anything in the whiskey family. Oh, you and Dean share that. All right. Would you rather never be able to drink whiskey again or never be able to listen to hip hop again? Oh, whiskey. Peace out. 
Ah, to me. He's out of whiskey. That was the easiest would you rather ever. All right, I change it. No question. Would you rather never listen to hip hop again or never be able to attend one of your children's birthday parties? Sorry, honey. <laughs> I'm going to say they, they exist for the rest. That's just one day out of the year. All right. Take a picture. Children's birthday parties and weddings or hip hop? You just got to try and like, you, you just made the easiest decision ever for me. I fucking hate weddings. I want no, I don't even have one. You really love hip hop. All right. No, we, we negotiated out of that. That was not part of the, like, I want no, no interest in wed the wedding at all. It's really a favor that I've, okay. Mm. I see. So this, you're, you're not making tough questions here. <laughs> Apparently. Now you want to ask a tough question. Like you would be, what would you rather do? Watch and never be able to watch the Seattle Seahawks ever again or hip hop. Now you're, Ooh. now you're making me actually think. All right. That's the question. Football. But, uh, I don't know. Like find a way to cheat out of the system. I don't know. No, you can't. You could listen to the game. Could you? No. I think it's just like no games. Oh. No games or no hip hop. I'm not gonna play. I'm out. <laughs> I'm hanging up. I'm I'm hitting leave <laughs> right now. All right. If that's how it is. Um, I'll choose for you. Ooh. Maybe. Liz would choose to get rid of football. That's an easy one. I yeah, I'm not a big fan of team sports, so hmm. sorry. I'm surprised we've made it this far. <laughs> um, I know which one my wife would pick. Which one? She'd want to have her Sundays back. Right. So right. She'd be like, get the hell away from, get that football out of here. Give me a whole day of my week back. <laughs> it honestly sounds like you guys have a really playful fun functional relationship. No codependence. Mm. Sounds awesome. No. She does It's also much. interesting though, that, that even though it's one game, it does take up an entire Sunday. But that's the, that seemed to be a very American football thing. Well, in, in my wife's defense, uh, now, Sundays, three TVs come out. The whole living room is three TVs. And it's not one game per se, because I usually need to watch the games, all the games before, as well as the games after, and the Sunday night game. Plus, we've got Monday night football, now there's Thursday night football, and then Saturdays are college football. So it does take a good 20 or so plus hours a week to get that game in. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> I guess she has a fair point. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> How does one become so smart but watch so much football? <laughs> Balance. Uh, uh, that's funny. <laughs> now, if people wanted to reach out to you and um, read or listen to your stuff, and there's a lot of awesome stuff that you've had. I feel like we've only just uh, the tip of the iceberg on today's podcast. Where could they find you? Maybe like social media or website or you tell us. Yeah, sure. The, I mean, if you want especially because of the Corona stuff, the pandemic, all of my classes are now online. Uh, and so basically I take all those lectures and put those up on my YouTube page. Cool. So and all the lectures uh, and I got a, I have so many that I've already filmed and recorded or edited and I'm just releasing uh, sports nutrition program, design, strength, conditioning stuff, muscle physiology, all that's just all free in the YouTube stuff. So that's there. The Instagram and Twitter are by far the the most active places for me social media wise and then twitter is nice in the sense that uh, you can direct links so if you're the folks that like to see the direct link to the study and stuff like that um, you can do it I, I i don't really do it, it's pretty much like it's science stuff so if you want to have a lot of pictures of ghostface killer i don't really do that sorry i don't post pictures of my fucking meals like <laughs> you gotta get a ass kicking face load of science on any of my stuff so that's pretty much what i stick to Perfect. Mm. And what's your Instagram handle? Oh, it's just my name, Dr. Andy Galpin, Dr. Andy Galpin. Okay. Perfect. The book's out there too, if you want to track that down, but you can just find the, I think I made a, a talk on my YouTube page that's like five minutes or seven minutes or something, and that basically summarizes my entire book too. So if you want to just get the quick version, you can do that instead. He really is good at business, this guy. Oh, God. Um, how does <laughs> your uni feel about you posting up the lectures online when the students? Well, I am tenured and promoted to full professor, so I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you really think. <laughs> now, listeners, I really do encourage you to go check out Andy's stuff because there is just a new world of, of knowledge. And I think that the way you deliver information as well is like simple enough that everyone can understand it, but you haven't oversimplified anything where you're missing out really important things. So... So I really love your content and um, thank you for being awesome. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. That was very nice of you to say. No problem. And thanks for coming on. Very much appreciated. Cheers.